Hey, welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. I'm your host, Stevie Taylor. This is episode 103. Jim Kelly, here we go. My guest today is Australian guitar legend, educator and studio owner, Jim Kelly. Jim has firmly established himself as a leading Australian contemporary jazz and blues guitarist, composer and educator, whose reputation goes well beyond Australian shores. In 1975, Jim co-formed Crossfire, Australia's most celebrated jazz fusion group. From 1975 to 1987, Jim perfected the rigorous demands of the recording studio and became a highly sought-after session player, performing on countless jingles, documentaries, film scores, plus pop and jazz artist albums. Jim also performed and recorded with Australian artists Kerry Bedell, Renee Geyer, Johnny Farnham, Debbie Byrne, John English, Tommy Emanuel, Erin Clark, Don Burrows, James Muller and Dale Barlow, just to name a few. The 90s saw a change of lifestyle for Jim with a move to northern New South Wales to lecture at the Southern Cross University in Lismore, where he was head of guitar studies for 17 years. Jim has since resigned from full-time academia and now runs a recording studio from his home, Tone Ranger Studios. He's produced many fine albums and has quickly achieved the reputation of becoming a world-class producer and mixing mastering engineer. Jim is a musician dedicated to the art of improvising, composing, performing and teaching and is always searching for new ways to expand his musical horizons. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please give it up for Mr. Jim Kelly. I think we're rolling. Jim Kelly, welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me. This is, uh, I don't uh, do too many of these things, but when I get asked, I, I always say, yes, I enjoy it. Great. And I'm, I'm honored to have you on the show, Jim. I'm, I've wanted to have you on the, the show for, for quite a while, but I didn't quite know how to get hold of you. And um, Dave Sanders yep. sent me a message on Instagram and said, hey, you need to talk to Jim Kelly. And I said, yeah, I know. But I don't know how to get hold of him. <laughs> so Gee, I hope Dave was right. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so, uh, yeah, Dave. Dave connected us via email, and, yeah. and here we are. And it's um, great. Yeah, it's taken us four shots at this. It has. Um, yeah. The first time, my kids and my wife got sick, so I had That's to look right. after them. Yeah. The second week, you got sick. Yeah. You got you got um, tinnitus in your <laughs> in your ears. Yeah. Last week. We had a we had a local bushfire not far up here, and it took out all the internet. Yeah. So, uh, so that was week three, and then here we yeah. are today. <laughs> Great. So, so fingers crossed, we uh, we, yeah. yeah, we keep. Aren't, aren't, aren't we tenacious? Oh, totally. It's the way. <laughs> um, now, I just want to mention, like I've been um, communicating via email with your manager, which is your lovely wife, Jules. Yep. Yeah, she and, does uh, all that for me. Yep, and um, you guys were just away in, in Queensland last week and um yeah. <laughs> she said in her email um that as you got as you guys got home there was a python yes. cruising in through the cat flap. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the timing was perfect. Its right. head was just 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 coming through and it was having a look around as we walked in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it wasn't too much of it. We're used to them, by the way. Oh, know? really? No, and, you, uh, can, you can have that. <laughs> They're yeah, all yours. yeah. I, I don't, there's hardly a house up in this area that doesn't have a resident um, python or carpet snake living in the roof, you know. Oh, wow, stuff that. <laughs> and, yeah, but you, you may not see them for years, right. you know. it's still there. And then all of a sudden you see them, you know. Yeah. yeah, see, being from New Zealand myself, there's no snakes, there's no spiders. no. Nah. Um, nah. And like I've been in Australia for a while now, and um, I would say down here in Sydney, I've seen maybe two snakes, if that. Yep. Yeah. And uh, that's two's enough. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's enough for me. Yeah, I know. It's uh, one of those aversion things. I mean, some people at spiders or snakes or both or whatever. Uh, I, I'm not that keen on spiders, yeah. but snakes don't somehow, I, I don't know, I just, they don't bother me. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, now, how's, uh, how have you guys fared through the whole COVID thing? Um, let's well, talk a little bit about that. It's almost, um, I almost feel embarrassed to say this. Because of uh, my change of um, lifestyle, what I'm doing in music these days, it actually hasn't affected me at all. Mm -hmm. If anything, it may have made me gather slightly a little bit more work mm. because I picked up a few more buddies and, and, and people that needed my services uh, because they are because the COVID was affecting them and they started to record more at home mm -hmm. and then would uh, ask me to mix things, et cetera, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I'm reluctant to say it, but I'm obviously I'm pleased for um, my little business here. Mm. COVID actually didn't touch me, you know. That's good. And, and we're talking yeah. about your, um, your recording studio, which is Tone Range we are. Studios, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about yeah, that sure. a bit later if that's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah I'd like to. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, don't be don't be embarrassed that it didn't affect you. Like, I mean, oh, it's just that so many mates that oh, have no. done it really. I mean, I've heard like from really tough to not being affected to actually some people saying it actually worked in their favour in yeah. some sort of weird way. So yep. it's a bit of a rainbow of um, depending on what you were doing and and what uh, luck you had in the way things moved around, you know, because of it. Mm. All right, well let's uh, let's roll it right back now. Right back okay. to the to the beginning. Um, sure. Yeah. So where were you? Where were you born? I was born in Sydney, nineteen fifty. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. now uh, d uh, you're from Northern Beaches, is that right? Yeah, my childhood was pretty much between um, uh, earlier days, like Narrabeen, mm -hmm. and then um, most of my uh, childhood, younger years, and then into the teenage years, were spent living in Dy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now. Was there music in the family with your um, parents, musicians, and, and do you have, no, do you have no. siblings? No, this is um, a total black sheep. Okay. Absolute. It, came, it sort of came from nowhere. I, that's one of those things I've thought about that the, as I've the older I've got. It just, no, it um, from that angle, it came from nowhere, but there was an influence. Uh, anyway, ask me more and we'll get to that influence because yeah. you may have some questions yeah, yeah, for at sure. this point. Yep. So um, now, in saying that you were the black sheep, were your parents still listening to music? Was they still, uh, were they you know they still listening to records and stuff like that? And were you, okay. were you were you starting to, you know, getting get a bit of vibe into music, or did you? Get yeah. Back okay. Else? Well, yep. th this is where I can bring this um, story up. Yep. Um, my parents um, they liked to party, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a double. Uh, not a double garage, but a big garage. And uh, it was done up in a festive kind of party way with Casper, the Casper, the rather the friendly ghost painted on the wall and stuff <laughs> that me and my sister did because we, we were okay at drawing and all that sort of thing. And uh, so there were often parties would erupt in, in the, in the, in the garage for the neighbors mm. predominantly. And, uh, we were lucky enough to have a guy that lived opposite us in the suburban street of um, DY. It was called Wadden Avenue, by the way, for those enthusiasts about that sort of thing. Um, his name was Mervyn Chambers. And when I was, um, you know, like eight, nine, he was already, uh, he would have been in his 50s. And he was a very interesting man. He worked from home. So he didn't go to work, which is pretty unusual for that that kind of um, society back in those days. He was kind of a thinker, an inventor. He was a, a an artist. He, he, uh, he used to paint, and he had and he still played the banjo, and he used to play with Ray Price, one of the early um, trad band um, characters uh, of Sydney. He used to play with Ray Price, so he'd had a, a kind of a colourful life, if you like. Mm -hmm. So uh, we all liked him because he was different and he smoked a pipe mm -hmm. and he was a large man. He was uh, a, a different individual. Anyway, at the parties that we had, we, which we had many, yes, there was always the, the 45s records were going on to the little um, 
you know, the little player. And it was always Roy Orbison and, and Elvis Presley and, and songs of the day, hits of the day, and um, Bobby Darren, et cetera, and so on. And people would dance to the music and, you know, they'd drink lots of beer and carry on. And I'd watch the whole party go on and as kids, you know, like you loved it because you, know, you be, could be mischievous and everything while the party was going on. Mm. But at one point in the party, Merv Chambers, Mr Chambers to me, invariably had me dis, would dispatch me over the road to go and get his banjo. So he, I put the banjo in his hands and then he'd start playing tunes. And he played in the, uh, he didn't do the Earl Scruggs finger-picking style stuff. He played the, you know, the strumming one, just mm. like that rhythmic, but he could play um, melodies and play tunes like Bye Bye Blackbird and and all songs of the day, really, I guess, mm-hmm. you know. The minute he did played, the party really would take off. And that's that's what I remember. That's where I I noticed, I didn't notice then, but in, in hindsight, I went, oh, that was me witnessing the power of music, mm. what it did to people. Yeah, yeah. And I loved it too. I was transfixed. And I was always at him, you know, when he was at these parties going, Mr. Chambers, can I go and get the banjo now? And he'd say, no, not now, James, because everybody called me James back then. <laughs> he'd say, no, not now, James, I'm not ready. And now I know what that meant. He just had to have more beer and whatever. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah. there'd come the point where I'd happily, happily run over and get the banjo and then watch the party really change. Yeah. So I think that's kind of where the very first, seeds of the love of music came into me. Right. You know? Yeah. Right. right. So when was the moment that you decided that you wanted to play an instrument? And was okay, it, well, were you thinking were you thinking banjo there or did you, <laughs> <laughs> were you or did you hear something else, a guitarist or, or something? I always love talking to a comedian. <laughs> 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 um no. I, okay. There's a little bit to this. There's another add-on to this story. Cool. On the other corner, opposite our house, because we lived on a corner, so one of the other houses looking into ours, there was um, a kid about my age. Gee, this is going to be funny if he's actually hears this one day, um, (laughs) about my age. And he was one of those, um, they had a brick home, we had a fibro home. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were better placed, you know financially his train set was bigger than mine his bike was better than mine everything that he ever had and apparently he did better at school than i could do and that guy was yeah he's one of those guys you know so but i used to hang out with him because i like playing with his big train set and all that sort of stuff anyway his parents got him a ukulele for one of his birthdays at about the age because i took it up when i was about 12 12 13 around about there and they were kind of um, uh, having a little bit of a, you know, a gloat to uh, my uh, my parents about how good he was. He was really, you know, coming on quickly with on on the on the ukulele. And I just I just went because I love music. I said to my mum, I said, when it's my birthday, can you get me a ukulele? I'm I, I'm going to. I reckon I can play it better than Alan. His name was Alan. Mm. I said I reckon I could play it better than him. You know maybe there's something I can do that I, I, that's better than what he's up to. <laughs> and anyway, they, they did get me the, the ukulele and I kind of went whoosh, you know, and Merv Chambers, because he played banjo, um, he, he could play ukulele, of course, you know, like everybody that plays the guitar can play the uke and all that, mm-hmm. you know, all that sort of follow on. Uh, and he showed me a couple of chords and off I went. And then all after a couple of weeks, he, he said to my mum one day, he said, you know, James is got a bit of a talent for this. He's learning really quickly. He's got good hands. And, um, then I said to my mum, well, can I have a, I want an acoustic guitar. I want to, I want to go to the guitar. So then went to the guitar. And then after that, it, I went to the electric and that's, then I started listening to the shadows and it sort of went whoosh from that point on. And right. I've got a little story about the shadows too, by the way, Right, but so that, that's ha- what this- did, that's what did it. Yeah. Right. You would have obviously heard in, in Harry Bruce's um, podcast that we did that Hank yep. B. Marvin was yep. was the guy for Harry as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, he had a, um, a it's still a beautiful sound that he had. He had a, yeah. a tap, a way of playing melodies, um, you know, just basically straight melodies really, but but sort of being able to crawl inside you, you yep. know. Yep, So uh, I, I loved it. That's great. Yeah. So did you um, start seeking out lessons at that stage or were you <laughs> self Gee, you ask good questions, man. That, <laughs> this is, you, you, you're just making it so easy for me to tell you the, the, the <laughs> continuum of, of this business that yeah. I've been talking about. Yeah. Okay, so, yes, what, what happened, I did. Um, I went, I found, it was hard to find somebody, I have to say, but I found someone who could teach me a little bit more about the guitar in a music store on the beachfront of Manly. Mm-hmm. So I used to have to get the bus there. And his name was Mr. Peachy. Mm-hmm. And he was a pommy guy with uh, really thick glasses and the ever-present little fag rolly, you know, on his lip. Yeah. And always looking down through his glasses with his head up. So I'm about 14 or something now. He would have been, oh, maybe 75. Yeah. He was an old boy, you know. And anyway, I just went, someone's gonna to, gotta to teach me something about this. And then I I did a few lessons with him. And then he said to my mum, there's no point James coming to me anymore. I can't teach him. He's such a fast learner. <laughs> he says he's one of the best, he's one of the best uh students, you know, like in, in that sense that he'd that yep. he'd had. Yep. Um, so that that was what happened then. Then Nothing happened lesson-wise, but then I bumped a guy called Cliff Lambert who owned a, a real Stratocaster. I mean, a fair dinkum, you know, Stratocaster. Mm. I'd never really seen one up close before, but he had one. Mm. And I got to know him and we were talking. He said, I I said, I like playing Shadows tunes. And he said, oh, me too. And... Um, I said, do you know so-and-so? And And he went, yeah, yeah. He said, I can play them all. I said, you can play them all? I said, I can only play like six of them because I used to go down and order the sheet music in from the local store and get the, you know, the old-fashioned sheet music and take it home, put the record on and kind of uh, look at the chord symbols and and sort of figure out how to do it. Mm. I said, well, how how do you know them all? You can't get all the sheet music. He said, oh, I just figure them out by ear. Mm. And that's when I went. Well, I don't even know what that means. Yeah, I don't. Right. I have no concept of what that means. He said, yeah. "Well, I figure out what the chords are." And I said, "But how can you figure out what the chords are? Because there's always six notes in the chords." Because I'm thinking, right. you know, you're strumming the guitar. There's yeah. six strings. There's got to be six notes. Yeah. And he said, "Ah." Oh, he said, "Look, come over to my house." He was over at Curl Curl, not too far away from Dy. He said, "Come over, and I'll show you what I do." So over to his house. We played through a couple that I knew, Apache and, and stuff like that. And um, then he showed me what he did and he had a turntable. He put the vinyl on and he said, you know, I listened to it. Then I tried to figure out the melody line, but then I listened to what the chords are and what the bass is playing. And I figure out whether the chords are major chord or a minor chord in particular, you know, because that's kind of the basic chords that we use back in those. It's pretty simple music. And he taught me the difference between the sound of those. And I have to say that was probably will stand as the greatest lesson almost anyone's ever given me in my life. He showed me that the way to learn to play music is to use your ears. Mm. That's how you learn. If you're playing a harmonic in- instrument I'm talking about, mm. uh, that's how you do it. So uh, I, I quickly adopted that method of frustrating at first to try to do it. And he and I formed a duo together called The Strays, and we had little jerkins that were like um, that shiny material with a with a big S on it. And we used to play in a, we played in a couple of milk bars for milkshakes. Oh, great! <laughs> I <That's> remember cool. <laughs> yeah. playing Shadows tunes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was your um, was your uh, music collection starting to change? Were you listening to different types of music at that stage? Seeking out yeah more guitarists and yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It uh, of course it 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 went on from the the shadows. I, I the Aussie band. There was an Aussie band I really loved called um, uh, the Atlantics. Mm-hmm. 
I really love that band. They, and they did an instrumental thing as well. And I, I really fell in love with, with what they were up to. But then, of course, it became the Beatles and the Kinks and the Rolling Stones It's and that kind of thing, uh, that, that British invasion sort of um, music, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. for a lot of it. And then it quickly led into, funnily enough, into an interest in jazz. Mm. So by the time I was only been playing for about three years, four years maybe, three years, I developed a real interest in jazz. Who was the who were the players, or what or what was the act that um, made you start thinking and listening to jazz? Well, it was a band that um, I was in um, where we needed. We'd lost one of our singers. The band was already working and doing just music of the day, you know, the kinks and all that stuff locally. Mm. And we lost the um, the singer. Something happened there. I can't remember. And uh, we put an ad in the pay local paper or just Sydney Morning Herald or whatever for a singer wanted for a band. And uh, a few fruitcakes turned up and then <laughs> all of a sudden um, somebody who could really sing turned up. Right. And I don't know whether this name means anything to you, Stevie. This may not, but you may not know about this person. But a gal called um, Kerry Bedell turned up. And, no, I, and, I can't. I can't okay, know the name. Kerry Bedell. Mm -hmm. She died just a couple of years ago. Kerry Bedell will go down in history as one of the greatest singers uh, in Australia, and and one of the greatest singers in the world. Mm -hmm. She was recognised the world over. Wow. This. She turned up for an audition in my garage with the Casper the Friendly Ghost painted <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> and she liked what our band was up to and liked what I was up to, and she kind of got me into jazz. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it happened. Now, who were those jazz guitarists then? The one that floated my boat because it basically was the first jazz guitar player that I heard was um, Herb Ellis playing Bye Bye Blackbird, okay. <laughs> for a tune that I knew well. Yeah. So I, I knew the melody. Mm. I never really played the tune, but I knew the melody in my head. And then I heard him play a solo on it, and I just remember thinking, how can he do that? Mm. What I like what he's doing, but how does he know how to do that? You know? Mm. Uh so the, the jazz quest had started and then I quickly moved into uh, Barney Kessel and then found that the, the largest, longest lasting love of my life on the guitar, Wes Montgomery, mm -hmm. appeared and he became my kind of, you know, my uh, distant mentor, if you like. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, were you starting to gig a fair yep. bit at this stage? Yep, yep, yep. With with Kerry, the we formed the band uh, formed at that moment. She was there. It became a band, mm -hmm. and personnel changed and things like that. And yes, we ended up doing the circuit and going to Melbourne and doing things and doing all that surf clubs and stuff. Playing sometimes we were playing like jazz tunes, you know, with a kind of um, a bit of a workover way of our way of doing it. So it was a very unusual band. But because Kerry was the singer, that nobody could miss her talent. That heard her. It was it, honestly, it was it was jaw dropping what she could do. Mm. Um, uh, so we had a. It was a strange band, but it, it sort of ended up with a kind of a, almost like an underground following, if you like, because it was weird, you know. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'll just paint the picture a bit about Kerry because a lot of the people sure. listening to this may not know it either. And you can you can go and look her up, of course, you know. Well, well I'll find a link for her and I'll put yeah. her in the show notes yeah. of this. So we yeah, Kerry Bedell. Yep. B-I-D-D-E-L-L. -L. Mm -hmm. She, at one point in her life, she was taken across to Las Vegas to the MGM and they were grooming her to become the next biggest Las Vegas singer following in the footsteps of Mel Torme and all of the other greats that have ever been there. Mm -hmm. She was at that level. Mel Torme loved her. Right. She just had everyone's attention. She, it, it was, what she could do was, uh, words fail me. Right. And, uh, 
But she was such a, a down to earth uh, Aussie gal, she couldn't stand Las Vegas and and the American way. So she just kind of went, ah, stuff this. I'm out of here. <laughs> she has she has walked out in the contract. Yeah, well, she just went. I've had enough. Yep, it's too stupid for words. Yep, came back. <laughs> right. Did you have anybody else in that band that was kind of, um, how do I say, kicking your ass? Bit of a like a a senior in the ba- in the band, you know, like like the like a, a mentor in the band. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, not in that band, not okay. not with the other players because it was um, it was guitar, bass, and drums. But Kerry okay. was always kicking my ass okay. musically because <laughs> yep. um, of what she uh, knew about chords and harmony. She played piano, a bit of piano as well, quite okay. a bit. And the way her ears worked, she could kind of hear any chords and and decipher any any anything when she was using her ears to figure out what stuff was. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And she knew how chords were formed and what jazz, the sound of jazz chords and the extensions and all that sort of stuff, and I didn't. And she taught me a hell of a lot um, about the way that that kind of worked. And and I'd taken up prior to, to that, certainly even before I met Kerry, I was very driven to the point of um, picking up a lot of texts and studying. Um, I've been always self-motivated about studying. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to have anybody tell me to study or what to study. I kind of could always sniff out what I needed to do to become good at it somehow. It just seemed obvious to me, you know. I mean, I needed – I figured – I need to know scales. I need to know how to play scales mm. and what they mean and, and how they work. So I bought books about that. Sal so, Salvador's Single String Studies for Guitar. I went through that book. I chewed up a few books and uh, and kept doing that because I'm a self-taught player, actually. Okay. Really, yeah. So. Um, now, once this band was Kerry, um, uh well, I don't know if it dissolved or whatever, but oh, sorry. Let let me let me say, were you were you starting to get some other gigs as well while um, in this band with Kerry? Was your horizon starting to broaden a little bit? Yeah, um, towards the end of the life of that band, yep. um, what happened? We won a uh, one of those competitions of the day called the Hoadley's Battle of the Sounds, mm-hmm. but we won the vocal section. Um, because we knew we wouldn't be able to win the, the band section because the band was too kind of peculiar in its um, eccentric or whatever in the stuff that we like to do. So we went, got smart and went, let's try and win it in the vocal section because we could get Kerry to train us um, <laughs> how to sing right. harmonies. Oh, my God, when I think of it now, I can't believe it. Uh, anyway, she <laughs> trained us and squeezed our faces at times, you know, to go, no, not <laughs> she'd squeeze your face. Yeah. So not like that. And um, uh, we won it. <laughs> oh, great. I mean, no one was more surprised than, than us. Right. We won it. So uh, that took us to England. And that was about 1969 or something like that, I think. Hoadley's Battle of the Sound Sign is 69. We went to England. But prior to going, the band had run its race. We thought, oh, we'll, we've got a, a free trip to England. We're going to mm-hmm. go over there. And uh, we'll all rattle around for a while and then everybody can do what they want to do and come back okay. and uh, that'll be the end of the band. One of the guys stayed on, uh, Mike Hallett, became a big-time producer okay. um, over there. And Tony Bolton, the drummer, came back before we did. Kerry and I stayed for uh, quite a few months. Uh, we were an item at the time mm-hmm. and then came back and then sort of our separate ways at that point. And by then I got into an, other bands and then I started to get an interest in becoming a session guitar player. Right. And I set my sights on that round about sort of the age of 20, 21. I thought okay. I'm, I want to be a session guitar player. Now what do I need to do to become one? Mm-hmm. And I realised I needed, number one, the first thing I needed to do was learn how to read music. Okay. So I set about that business of teaching myself how to read music, mm. you know. When did you learn about session musicians? Um, was there a particular session guitarist or um, 
because we are oh, that, that's probably around the time of the wrecking crew as well i'd say am i right there uh i'd say so yeah yeah wrecking crew on one side and then you've got you, you've got the funk brothers of motown over there and you've got the stacks band and you know that were you kind of uh wary of 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 that scene at that at that stage, or was there a was there a session guy, okay, a guitarist in in Australia that that sort of triggered it? Yeah, triggered it. Yes. Um, I'm just think, scrolling back. It's um, it gets blurry, you know, because nothing's black and white in all these things. They're so kind of follow on. But sure. okay, what it was, there was a guitar player called. Oh yeah, okay. I got a little story. Little um, sort of makes sense of what cool. I'm going to say. Um, when I was, um, yeah, when I was about 17. That's right. I forgot about this. I found I needed to get a, a more teaching from somebody, and I started to ask around with just musicians in general who was the the best guitar player in Sydney, the Sydney area. You know that I could go and and get lessons with. Mm-hmm. And one name kept coming up, and his name was Peter Martin. And I went, oh, i got to get some lessons with Peter Martin. So I found Peter Martin, and he lived at Manly Vale, which wasn't too far away from DY. I mean, lucky. Mm. But when I, I tracked him down, I tracked down his parents, they said, oh, yeah, you found the right place and the right guy, but he's overseas at the moment. He's been doing gigs in London and then studying some uh, Spanish guitar in, actually in Spain. Mm. They said he'll be back in six or nine months or something at the time. I went, okay, I'll bide my time. When he came back, I pounced on him and said, introduced myself and said, I want to get lessons. And he said, oh, I don't really teach. I said, no, but, but will you? Will you teach? Show yeah. me something. Yeah. He said, oh, okay, come round. You know, yeah, he said, I'll do it. So I went round, and he was a little bit older than me by a few years, not too many and, of course, he, he knew a lot of stuff. He knew a lot of stuff. Mm. Anyway, we played together. I thought I was going around for about an hour lesson. We played all afternoon. And th- at the end of it, he said, do you want to be in a band with me? <laughs> right. So, you know, he, he, he could see that there, I had a good potential and I was I had some stuff together and, and I was dead keen, you know. So what happened was because – that led into the session thing that he ended up forming a band called the Southern Contemporary Rock Assembly, SCRA for short, S-C-R-A. And it was a big band. It's about 12 or 14 or 15 people in it. And he started, because he was a really strong player, he was getting sessions in Sydney. And I went said, oh, Peter, I'd like to get into sessions. And he said, oh, I think you could, you know, but you're going to have to learn to read and all that. Uh, so that's when I got onto the quest of learning, getting some more skills. And then once I got a bit more stuff under my belt, um, he uh, would suggest to people that if he couldn't do something that maybe they like to try me. And the same thing had happened because Kerry Bedell, being the, the, the almighty talent that she was, she had already been doing sessions and okay. she recommended me as well. Okay. So all it took was a couple of recommendations. And if you did a good job and didn't let anybody down, the chances were you get another invite back and it kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. So do you remember your very first session, what it was? Oh, gosh. The very first one. No, I don't think I can actually. Mm-hmm. Did so many of them. Yep. I, I remember it would have been terrifying, but I can't remember. It's probably why you can't remember it. Probably. So <laughs> what I tell you how I learned to read too, by the yeah, way. Cool. I want to yeah, just cool. say this because yeah. you go, how do you learn to read? Yeah. Well, there's sort of only one way to learn to read, really. You have to be thrown in the deep end. It really is tough love. It's like the old way of teaching somebody to swim, throw them in the the, the end of the pool where they can't stand up. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not a good idea really, but, but you know what I mean? Not it's these days. Lo- not these <laughs> days, but that, that's the way life worked a bit more back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and reading, it's it basically, I don't know if there is any other way to do it. Um, so I went, well, how do I learn how to read? So I started boning up on it and trying to write stuff out. And then I managed to get a two-week, I mean, a, a two-day every week, um, 
two weeks of working in a uh, for the ABC show band, which is a big band with horns and strings, and we used to they used to record it at a um, where was it in Taylor Square in a church. That's right in Sydney, mm. Taylor Square in a church, and we used to spend two days every week there. And you'd walk in and on your music stand would be a stack of charts, you know. I don't know. There could have been 20, 40 songs there that you were going to record that day for the ABC music archives. Singers were going to come in, blah, blah, blah. You got one kind of uh, run through of the tune and then it was record. And there was a guy called Roy Plummer who was the older guitar player established that was there. And uh, he was he was a nice dude. Uh, he was actually he was um, he was a, he was so much older than me, and he was of the vintage where he'd actually seen Django Reinhardt play over in um, in in England because he was a pommy. Um, and he was really helpful to me. I've noticed that a lot of the older players, because I was always younger. Now I was incredibly younger than a lot of the people I was playing with, because I seemed to kick on fairly quickly. Everybody was nice to me, really, because they could see I was so keen. You know, mm. I really wanted it. You know, I really wanted to become a good musician and a good guitar player. And so uh, they all helped me, and Roy helped me so much get through that nerve wracking business of being thrown in the deep end about reading charts and stuff uh, with a very uh, cantankerous band leader with a big handlebar moustache. Um, and Roy. <laughs> Roy helped me out a lot, I can tell you. Yeah. 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 He could read anything, by the way. Yeah. Roy right. could read. He could transpose stuff on the spot. If they said, uh, we need to take the chart down a tone, I'm going, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Roy, Roy could yeah. just look look at the, I mean, it's not so hard with chords sometimes, but he could yeah. just look at written lines and just go, okay. He could just do it. Right. Yeah. Did you ever cop a hard time from the from the band leader? Yeah. I, yeah, um, I copped a hard time from that band leader sometimes because he was he was pretty prickly. Uh, Roy saved me so many times. Right. And a couple of times Roy said, oh, he, he said he's mean, you know, he, he said he shouldn't have, he said he's asking too much of you, you know, because he said he knows that you're, you're young and trying to get it and you're getting it. He felt for me. So he really bent over backwards to help me. Yeah, that's um, cool. Yeah, but uh, no, I've had a couple of prickly uh, situations. Of course, all of us have, really. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. No one gets away with it, really. If you're insular in your own band, well, that's different. You, yeah, you're going to you, it's that's another world to me. But if you're going out as a hired gun, um, you're going to meet situations where perhaps you're not doing what they think that you should be doing. You know? Of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so back into the session scene now. Yep. Um, so you would have been doing jingles, yep, demos, yep, you know, albums, documentaries, um, documentaries, right? Yep. Okay, Docos, and uh, yep. yeah, were you doing uh, were you doing movies, TV? Yes, right. everything, the whole, right. every every aspect of it in some sort of way. Over the years that I did it, um, I I covered every kind singular aspect of it. Yeah, right. Yep. So. Did you know what type of session you were going in for when you when you would get a call? Would you would it be a call like I be be at such such and such studio at this time and yeah, yep. Would they would they say well this is a we're doing a doco or you're doing an album or you're doing a, a whole bunch of demos or yes, yep. What what you yes you would always know whether you're going in to you know do exactly what you just said. Yep. What you didn't know sometimes was. I mean, if you're going in to do a jingle, they usually were they were very easy. Okay. If you're going in to do uh, a record with someone, they there might be some prickly stuff in there to handle. If you're going in to do some Muzak, I did a lot of Muzak type sessions. They were nerve wracking because sometimes you would get charts that with very difficult stuff written down that they expected you to play. Can you tell me what Muzak is? I haven't heard that. Muzak, heard Muzak that was a um, a term for um, what it's been called elevator music. 
Oh, okay. Think of Kenny G. I got you. I now. don't mind saying that, actually. <laughs> Muzak. In fact, I'm pleased to say that. Um, yeah, like just Muzaki. It's just pleasant, whatever <laughs> yeah. bullshit, yeah. you know, that gets yeah. recorded. And, you know, you'd go in the lift in David Jones or whatever in Gowings in town. And, right. you know, and they'd be playing that sort of music, you know, it supplied that sort of little backdrop thing to right. life. Right, so it's, it's, it's like library music. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, gotcha, right. Yeah, music. like library music. music. Yeah, yeah. Music. yeah, they call it music. That's what they call it. Right. So it's sort of mu- music, but really it's sort of like music. And it became a term. We went, <laughs> oh, another music thing. Oh, God, help us all. <laughs> you know, but they it paid the bills. Yeah, of course, yeah. One of the things I realised about that, by the way, when you're playing disco music with the bass going, dung, ding, dung, ding, dung, ding, dung, ding, dung, ding, you know, or real old-fashioned stuff, yep. I, I would never listen to it, but actually it was quite fun to play. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It was funky, you know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Now, at the at the heyday of it all, how many sessions would you be doing a day? And, and was it a case of, I mean, I've heard, Heard stories, um, like uh, for example, the Wrecking Crew. Um, yeah, you know how Blaine would would have a drum kit set up in this studio, and he'd be on that session from that time to that time. His cartage and his people had already had another kit set up at the studio, so it would be straight. Over to that session. Meanwhile, someone p- packs up that drum set, takes yep. it to that studio. Was it was it ever like that? In a way, but not quite as um, illustrious and streamlined, perhaps. Yeah. The, on the big days, I the big a big day would be where I'd do three. Mm-hmm. I maybe did four, maybe a few times a day, mm. but that would mean that would mean that the people that were booking you understood that uh, like the first couple were going to have to be done quick and that may have worked fine because they 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 knew you by then. They'd say, oh, it's just a jingle. You'll be yep. out in an hour. Yep. You'll be out in an hour. You'll have plenty of time, you okay. know. So it'd be three, but on the big days, but that would mean me schlepping the gear three times. So, I, okay, so that I, had, gonna, I had no one carrying the gear. That was going to be my next question. Did you yeah, have somebody yeah, helping no. you? There okay. were times towards the end where, yes, I would have to get somebody to do something in that way because the time yep. was tight. But yep. mainly I, I did it myself, you know, okay. like everybody did actually. Everyone right. did. Yeah. Right. You slept your own gear. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I mentioned Wrecking Crew and, you yep. know, Funk Brothers and, you know, there's other sort of groups where it's a core um, group of musicians that are doing all those sessions. Now, um, was there a core of, of you guys, yourself and a bass player, drummer, or whatever? Was it the same guys that were basically doing most of the sessions? I don't think it was as um, tight-knit as what the, the our American counterparts were. Okay. Um, ours probably was a little bit more like the L.A. scene. That's That's the one that we looked at the most. Yep. Where there definitely were rhythm sections that worked together. Yep. But there wasn't like ones that you'd sort of go to like and call them like like the wrecking crew and yep. uh, it, it used to be called like the hit makers and stuff. You know, yep. it wasn't quite like that. But there were ones like, for example, uh, with myself, obviously, um, Doug Gallagher playing the drums. Yep. Uh, Greg Lyon playing bass and say Tony Ansel playing keyboards. We we did so many things together. Right. And of course you, we ended up becoming a good unit. So yep. and then people that were smart would recognize that by the way and go, oh let's book the unit, you know, because they yeah. all they got a language between themselves, you know. Yeah. So yes, it it happened, but I don't think it was quite as um tight knit as the wrecking crew. But then again I don't think that the LA scene was quite as tight as the wrecking crew either. It was a right. little bit more yeah. open. I just, I just threw that yeah. out as an example. No, it's a good example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a good one. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah, just really curious as to how that went yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. Um. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about Crossfire now. Okay. And how Crossfire came about. Um. What stage into this um session scene were you, and and when was that? When was that moment that you decided to form this band, Crossfire? Well, the crossfire thing, uh, let me see. 
crossfire started pretty early in the piece when I, I'd started doing sessions. Mm-hmm. And there was what's right, there was one point where I decided to um with my wife Jules, she's a pom, and we got married over there. We were gonna stay and see if I, we could make a bit of a go of it in um over in England. It didn't work okay. out. I wasn't happy over there, but I had a gig to go to in uh, Hong Kong that I'd knocked back before we went to the UK. And uh, when we decided to leave UK, instead of coming home, I called the band leader and said, is that gig still open? Mm -hmm. Um, His name was Peter Nelson. And uh, he'd lived in Hong Kong for quite a while. And he said, funnily enough, we have the guitar players decided to go home. So yes. I said, oh, well, I'll take it, you know, come over to Hong Kong and we'll just see what that's like for a while. Mm-hmm. When we got there, it was a just it was just a, a, a good band playing in one of the hotels six nights a week. And uh, that's where I met Greg Lyon, the bass player. Mm-hmm. And Greg, because he lived in the East for about uh, about seven years, six or seven years prior to that. He went over for the Vietnam business as a player, that is, as an entertainer, a player, and stayed on. And he was well ensconced in uh, that that neck of the wood of Asia. And uh, because he lived over there, he had access to a whole bunch of records and things that we weren't getting back here, vinyl. Okay. Okay. So his hotel room, which was where he lived, it looked like some sort of hi-fi shop. You know, he had right. stuff everywhere, turntables and whatever, good speakers and like hundreds and hundreds of vinyl records, Chick career and all this stuff that stuff that we hadn't heard back here. He's a really talented player and he was playing the bass unlike anything that I'd ever heard back here. Right, right. And then our so I get going in the band with with all that going on. And then Mick Kenny who was one of the linchpin players in Crossfire. He played trumpet and keyboard and he came over as a trumpet player. Was He took uh, the trumpet chair over in the band and, of course, with Greg and all that, we, we decided, gee, if we ever, when we all get back to Sydney, let's, let's, let's form a band and start playing some of this chick career stuff and let's yep. have a look at that sort of music, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I decided to break the contract. I didn't like living there. Either did Jules, my wife. Mm. So I broke the six-month contract after three months. And they said, oh, well, you can't. I said, well, (laughs) stop me. I'm going. You know, I'm out. Um, And I left. Greg and and, um, Mick stayed on in the band for a while. Then they went to the UK, I think, after that. And then we'd already said that when we all come back to Sydney, let's get a band together. So a couple of years or a year after that, we all did arrive back in Sydney and we got a band together. And that's how it started. So in a way, Crossfire did start in Hong Kong. Right. Because of the uh, – I knew Mick before that from Sydney, but neither Mick or I knew Greg really. So it was just hearing Greg's great um, bass playing that we went, yeah. wow, yeah. Let's, let's do this, you know. So that's kind of how it started. Mm. So from that moment we'd, where you guys had said, okay, when we come back to Sydney, let's put a band together. Yeah. Did you start uh, coming up with ideas and writing music for for that time when you guys ended up getting together in a studio or in a, in a room or whatever and to put this band together? Were you starting yeah. to think about that music? Well, what happened was um, I think um, what had happened was when I really think about it, Greg had come back, but I think he had to be down in Melbourne or something because that's where he came from first. So Mick and I started, um, we started up a little yeah, a little blow kind of band at uh, a place called French's Wine Tavern on Oxford Street in Sydney. And uh, we had a, a bass player called John Young, Johnny Young playing with us. And I think it might have been John Proud playing the drums. And Mick had written two tunes at, at the time Mick Kenny had, cause he was, he, he's, he'd been deep into writing things and stuff I hadn't. And 
because we only had two tunes, that's what we played. We play one tune for a whole set, and then the second tune for the <laughs> <laughs> the second set. So they, lots, the, lots of the, solos and stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, the tune it sort <laughs> yeah. of it it just go for like you know go for an hour, you know, with <laughs> with everybody with it all breaking down and turning into all these other things because we're yeah, right. experimenting with improvising and and carrying on, you know. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, it was cool, and then. Greg came into the into it, and then we got a bit more serious, and then uh, we started doing more gigs, and the prospect of recording came up after a couple of years, and we decided mixed tunes they're they're unbelievable, but they are they're heavy going, like they're all they're mm-hmm. very deep, and there was a lot of classical kind of element in them as well, mm-hmm. so it was quite unusual. He had a lot of he had a strange mix of um, classical and gospel going on and and he loved uh, Miles Davis and like we all did, you know, yeah, and yeah. all our influences were pretty much the same, although I hadn't had much classical kind of influence at that point. So I we, we need more material. I thought, I said, well, what do you reckon, Mick? I, I might try and write something. Um, I've never written anything before. I'll, I'll write something and see if it works out. And I wrote a tune called Remember the Trees. That was my first song. And lo and behold, it, it it worked out and it it actually made it onto the first album. So the first song I ever wrote made it onto an album. Yeah, it right. was worthy, you know, of being on it. Right. And I realised, ah, oh, maybe I can do this, you know. So I just kept writing. And it's, right. like, it's like anything, if anybody writes a song, um, all you got to do is to get – better than is just keep writing other songs, you know. That's it. So that's, that's what it. I did. And then it worked out that Mick's stylistic way of composing and mine were totally different, but they worked well together, especially when you put them together and you formulated a, a, a night of music. They were good foils for each other, you know. Right. right. So uh, that's the way it sort of worked out. And then other guys in the band wanted to write stuff, of course, and we tried that, but it didn't seem to work out as much. So it was a bit more time wore on. Mick and I just said um, flat out to um, anybody that was in the band, uh, Jim and I handled the writing, you know. That's okay. that's okay. that's kind of the end of it. I was, I was going to ask about it. It's the identity of the band. It became the identity of the sound of the band. Yeah. And then because- people ask, did we write together? And we didn't. We never, ever wrote together. Right, we never collaborated because, because you're a you know you're a bunch of you know fiercely creative um, musicians. Um, yeah, to me, to me, trying to think about how how you would try and put that music together when you've all got these these fantastic ideas. If everybody was given open slather to be able to write, you can just imagine it just being train wrecks. Everybody wanting to get their thing in there, you know. But um, yeah. yeah, by sort of calling it at the start, saying, you know, we're we're basically the the two main writers. Yeah, let's kind of go with that. Yeah, that's, I that's mean, probably what works so well, eh? You hit something uh, a nail on the head there. As as the years wore on, because Crossfire ended up having a long life. Yeah, we ended up realizing that the demic, like the democratic approach to a band, uh, is very difficult. Yeah. Yes. It's it's it's. I don't think it actually works. To be honest no. with you, yeah, right. Um, it it needs to come from a, a smaller group of people within it, and that's the way Crossfire worked, or from a singular individual. Yep. And if you get if you got people that, that are doing that, that are that are good at it and nice about it, and and got the smarts, it works out. Because the democratic thing, in a way, hold, can hold you back because. If someone's got an idea and an opinion, you're duty bound to test it and suck it yep. and see and all that stuff, and uh, it can uh, lead to a lot of confusion. It takes up a lot of time, and sometimes it weak. It can weaken the uh, direction that the the whole thing might be going in. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about because yeah, uh, do you? I can tell. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you by me nodding and I can you know, yeah. smile? Yeah, but I think a lot of people might. Say that too. It's just yeah. one of those things as you get older, you realize. Yeah. If you're in a younger band and, and it always was that way, perhaps it can work. But when you get older and then you, you're getting more opinions about what it is and, and things that you like and 
uh, this, that and the other, but while still remaining open, you know, to uh, everything as much as uh, you possibly can, it's, uh, it can it can implode if if everybody's got equal say. Like I remember trying to mix something with Crossfire mm. and mm. everybody was welcome at the mix. Right. A whole day was wasted as right. people kept throwing their opinion in. Oh, the, that tom-tom's too loud. Uh, the, the kick drum, can that be fatter? Oh, can this? Uh, the horn, yeah. we're not hearing the horn enough. You know, it just went on and on and on. Yeah. And uh, finally it was people were shooed out of the room and it got down to <laughs> it got it got down to Mick and I and mostly me by the way yeah. I I realized that I I seem to have the better handle on uh, being able to talk to the engineer and, and realize the, the sound of the band a bit more perhaps than um, really anybody in it so it was just one of those mm. little maybe another side of my uh, musicality that was starting to pop up yep um, which is probably why I can do studio stuff now yeah it's always been there. I I never really pursued it until now, but there you go. Um, yeah. So was it? Were you guys always self-produced when it came to recording? Ah, a great question. Yes, the first one we did, no, okay. and um, first album we did, and we found it a bit difficult with the guy. He didn't really get what we were on about. He was he yep. was pretty cool, mm-hmm. but it was a little bit a little bit um, push and pull and unnecessarily so after that the next one we did we insisted that we produce it then by the time we'd done two or three albums and we really had a strong following i mean an enormous following right um when warner brothers grabbed us because they wanted us they just said there's no way in the world we're going to give you a producer they just said do what you do we love what you do nobody here knows anything about what you're doing we all like it just do it (laughs) <laughs> great. That's it cool. was great. Yeah. 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 Um, now, you guys were the first Australian artists to use direct-to-disc recording. We were. Right. So can you explain, for, for one, for the people that, that don't understand what that is and, and how that opportunity got presented and, and how it okay. all went down? Okay. Well, direct-to-disc became a bit of a fad thing there for a while. There were quite a few albums fell out of um, America with it. Um, in particular, what direct to disc was was a way in the traditional way of recording back in the day. You'd, you'd record to go onto a the two inch tape, as it were, the big reel going around, and this, everybody knows that look. Then that would get bounced down to a quarter inch tape. That tape then would go off to the uh, to the replicators, who that are going to turn it into vinyl. They would use that tape, and that's the sound that they would use then to cut a uh, a mastered, I've forgotten what the word is for that, acetate or something, I'm not sure, a mastered disc that they would cut and then use that as the master disc to make the uh, replicate it in vinyl. Yep. So there's, in other words, each each step of the way is a process through electronica, uh, noise introductions and, uh, and whatever, you know, mm. but that's the sound of vinyl. Mm-hmm. To do a direct-to-disc, it was the process of taking the two-inch tape and the quarter-inch tape out of the equation. You recorded and an engineer cut it straight onto that master um, disc, the 12-inch disc. So it was more pure. That Everything had a different transient sound, et cetera, and so on. So that's what it was in a nutshell. But it's difficult to do because you, you had to get round where the lathes were that could do the cutting. Mm -hmm. The lathes and all that machinery were too big to move, so you had to put the band around it. So we went, um, they took us to, uh, I've forgotten where it was, Uh, but we are set up in all these offices and stuff, you know, with the closed circuit TVs and people set up down alleyways uh, to make separation. And the thing is, when you do it, because records back then, I think they were like 44 minutes was... Uh, 22 minutes aside is the 45 minutes for an album. 22 minutes aside was you can't really go, you couldn't go above that because they couldn't cut enough um, uh, bass into it and all that stuff. There's a limitation to the amount of, um, you know, sort of levels and things you can put in vinyl. Yep. So they had to be 22 minutes. So we had to time the tracks out to come out at that. And once they start cutting, you can't stop. Yeah, you only yeah. stop after one yeah. side's done. So you have to do yeah. one whole side 
in one take, and that is doing silent count-ins and all that sort of stuff. So it was nerve-wracking, man. Yeah. It was nerve-wracking. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, you would really have to know your songs. and then oh, You had to know, yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. the tempo, is, I suppose the tempo is having, to, having it timed out to 22 minutes a side or whatever it yeah. was. Um, was the drummer playing to a click? Oh, no. Nah. There was no one. No one was right. kind of using click back then. No, it was, oh, oh, right, okay. Yeah, it's just, so you just had to be. On, you just had to be on. Just count, count. You know, because we played them so many times, just count it okay. off. Um, yep. I mean, one of the hardest things to do was for a guitar player, um, as much more so than anybody, is um, keep the guitar in tune. You yeah, know, right. See what I mean? Right. Like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe that was even before tuners were around. Because there's nothing, so, you know, because so if, you, if you record something, something's great that you do, but the guitar's horribly out of tune, it's buggered. I mean, it's, <laughs> That's it. it's a shot so duck, did, you know. How did you go about doing that? Was it well, a matter just, of getting yourself in that, in that, that whatever room you're in and getting it into yeah, an environment yeah, just, where you Yeah, just, yeah. you know, keeping your eye on it all and, um, mm. you know, in the, in the little break in between, putting your ear on the guitar and just quickly tuning a little bit or something, you know. It was, yeah, right. it was very nerve-wracking, man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's cool. Yeah. If I had two in my wallet, hey, I hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast. As you know, the Gig Life Podcast is free. You don't have to pay anything ever. But if you find the value in the Gig Life Podcast, you can donate or leave a tip. Go to the giglifepodcast.com, click on that donate button and give as little or as much as you like and just know that anything you give will go back into creating great content for this podcast. All right. Back to the episode. Now, um, how was uh, how was Crossfire um, taken internationally? Was there ever a point there where it, you know, could have been taken further? Poss- quite possibly. Um, yeah. I'll give an example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do believe. I think this is right. We were the first Australian band to be invited to play at the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland. When we worked with Michael Franks, uh, when that came about, at the conclusion of doing the tour with the American singer Michael Franks, and subsequently an album came out of that, which we didn't know we were going to do. He liked the band so much, he said, I want to make an album out of this. At the conclusion of that um, fairly short tour that we did with Michael, he said, I wish you guys lived in the States. He said, I would be happy to play on any stage in the world with you guys. Wow. He said, I would, because he was recording with Larry Carlton and Johnny Guerin and all these heavyweight people at the time, Joe Sample. But when he went out on the road, he couldn't get those people. They were too expensive. So a lot of the times the bands that he did get weren't quite as strong as the, uh, you know, those heavy, real heavyweight players. But he, Said to us that, said you guys, I'd, I'd be happy to have you play mm. behind me on any stage. So that meant a lot to us. Mm. Made us feel like we, you know, made some sort of inroads into it all. Right. So what did you what did you then do about that? Well, what we did about that was um, perhaps a, about um, nothing, I suppose. Um, it. It kind of got so it it sort of got so big for us here. I'll just give an example of the bigness. When we really sort of uh, hit our straps and people were taking a lot of notice, we did a little tour of Melbourne. Then on, I think on that second tour, we went down. We did say ten nights in a, in a row in um, mostly hotels in pubs around uh, in a in a uh, city Melbourne, a little bit out for a couple. Ten nights in a row, we were filling every single pub to capacity with standing room only and a queue out the front waiting for someone waiting to leave, like I'll let one more person in. <laughs> standing up, going burko to a bunch of lovely bunch of young men playing instrumental music. Can you believe that? <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> it's just when you say it now, you just go, is yeah. that did that really happen? It did yeah, happen. Right. You know, yeah. it did happen because yeah. no one had heard it before. Yeah. See, no one had ever really heard 
well, they hadn't heard the songs before because we wrote them. So you, yeah. you know, you're basically hearing it, and and hearing the the stylistic thing and the uh, and the the skill of the players, and the heavy emphasis on improvising that was in the yeah. band. It was big, yeah. you know. Some of the tunes they'd still go for you know twenty minutes. You know, we just let them yeah. if, if they're going, you just let them go, let it yeah. go. You know, yeah. people went it's crazy. Like, it's like Australia's weather report in a way. In a way, yeah. In a, in a way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say so. Yeah. So um, the years rolled on and we kept making records and things. Uh, we did quite a few. Um, and we had a couple of big moments with Lee Rittnow came out and did a yeah. tour with us, Michael Franks, the Montreux Jazz Festival. And we, uh, that that's the record. Is that the recording? Yes. That the- yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, the recording, yeah. 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 And yeah. That, that video, you can, you can watch the whole thing on uh, YouTube. Yeah, I've, I've, I've watched yeah, most yeah. of it. It's great, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it, but, but how do I, I think that it, it went for so long that, you know, the fusion thing started to corrupt a little bit, I thought. Okay. The goodness is the two things that happened in it to me. This, so this is just my opinion, you know, about mm. this, mm. but I was in it at the time, but this is my opinion. Two things happened. The bands that we're looking up to and following in the States started to become very, very complicated. There was a lot of chop um, business going on, especially with the Chick Career Band and all that, that album called Romantic Warrior. Um, Aldi Di Miola perhaps was on. Chops, chops, chops. And then there was a kind of a Muzaki thing that was going on with bands like Spira Gyra where they were just cute little (laughs) melodies. So there were these two... Um, things that happened to it that I didn't think were, were great for the overall thing. See, the Crossfire band was built more around blues and um, and gospel music and mix um, love of classical sounds and things. And so we had a slightly unusual thing in it, but nobody in the band was what I would call a technical virtuoso. We just okay. pulled together really nicely as a team. Yep. Um, and then, and we, our main group that we that we loved through the whole thing were the, were the Crusaders. They were, used to be called the Jazz Crusaders, and then became the Crusaders. And in fact, the the name Crossfire is is the title of one of Joe's samples uh, tunes, Crossfire, and he was the keyboard player in the Crusaders. Mm-hmm. We followed that style stylistically more, um, and then all of a sudden it started to become more chop, kind of heavy. So that once it became more chops and then sort of more muzaki, it sort of watered the whole thing down a little bit. In other words, the chops business was starting to ask too much of the listener to get involved. It was getting a bit too complicated for its own good mm. and, uh, you know, became a bit Olympic, you know, keep it up and you'll disappear up your own vortex eventually, you know. <laughs> and uh, and the and the muzaki one, of course, well, that's just silly. That's uh, just belittling the whole thing to me anyway. Yeah. So there was a kind of fracture in it, and fusion almost became a dirty word, you know. So I think uh, the band had gone long enough to see that we weren't going to get that any kind of worldwide traction. And the fact is, we still lived in Australia, by the way, and it is a long way away from the rest of the world. I mean, you know, it's it's all well. It's easy to say why didn't you go, but it's big, you know, to move families because there's there's guys in it that are married and children and and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's not easy. So uh, it just ran its um, kind of race, I guess, you know. Yeah. Okay. So what did you do after Crossfire then? Well, well, I won't say, I'm not saying that Crossfire ended and then you started doing something else. I'm sure you were yeah. doing other stuff as well. Of course I was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah, you were saying earlier that, you know, you're already entrenched into that into that session scene. Yeah. Um. How did you see that session scene start to change? Um, do you, do you remember any noticeable changes? You know, CD tape not getting used as much. Um, samples starting to get used. Yes, towards the end of my like yeah, yeah, towards yeah. the end of my career. In it, I, I, yeah. just to give you paint the picture about my session life, I did twelve years in it. Took mm. two years to gradually wind into it, yep. become quite well known or, or very well known, and mm-hmm. it took two years to fall out the other end, and eight years where I 
pretty much lived off it in a very exclusive kind of way. I'd, I'd do some gigs, but I was working so hard during the day, I wasn't trying to work myself completely to death. Yeah. So, um, you know, it there was a time where I was only doing the odd gig here and there, but it started to break down after that length of time and producers mm-hmm. change and want yep. new blood in it and all that sort of thing. I think sure. 10 years in the session world is, is like a kind of a generation for sure. Okay. Um, so, and I'd had enough by then. I'd had enough of doing it, schlepping the gear all of the time yep. and all that sort of thing. And, uh, yes, the, the drum machine had come into it. Things started to change a little bit. Click tracks came into it more. It ended up being not quite as much sort of good get together, all play together fun as it used to be, you know, yep. just the modern world had started. So that I fell out of that. I fell back into gigs again and, and really threw myself at that and did put together a lot of different bands that um, had a lot of success at the basement in Sydney, this, that, and the other. And then I started to see the whole music scene started to break down a little bit. A lot of my mates were finding it really difficult to make a living where prior to that, we could all make a reasonable living at this, you know? Um, And uh, that's when I started teaching more at home. I I could see it's going to change, you know, I could feel it and it did. I was right. And then the opportunity came to um, move up this way and do some teaching at the university here in Lismore, yeah. and that ended up being a 20-year, almost 18 years of teaching there, and I'm still up here now. I came up yeah. in 1990, by the way. Yeah. So I've always been a little bit uh, lucky in my ability to look at and, and sense the shift in yep. the business. What yep. do I have to do to keep in being involved in music to make a living for my family is mm-hmm. how I've looked at it and, and, and keep up the idea of being the musician that I want to be, you know? So that that's been my whole focus really, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So in a nutshell, I'll just sum that up. So that means um, gigs when I first started into the session world and Crossfire lived um, in, in amongst all that session world. Yep. Back to gigs again. Then that started the fracture, then a little bit more private teaching and then leave Sydney and do a 20-year stint at tertiary teaching. Yep. And now that brings me to now yep. that I'm finishing off the last quarter of my musical existence on this planet running a recording studio. Yep. Yeah. Now, when I, was, when I interviewed Harry, you might remember he was talking about, I was asking him a fair bit about the James Jamison hook. Yeah. Hook technique. And he said, and he remembers specifically a, a moment, a time where technically he was at his, like he just knew he was technically where he wanted to be. Right? Yeah. Have you ever had that, had that moment where you've, you mm. know, technically had this idea of how you wanted to play and then you've, you've, you've kind of hit that, um, Technical freedom, let's say, that you've, you know, you've got your facility down that whatever you're basically thinking you can play. I don't know whether I've really ever hit that one. Mm-hmm. What I've noticed is, um, what have I noticed? Technique means a lot of things, by the way. But if you're talking yeah, about okay. guitar players in particular, let's just stay yep. with that for a sec. Yep. When somebody says somebody's got good technique, generally they mean the person can play quickly. They got good velocity. That's kind of the general way of trying to indicate what the word he's got or she's got good technique. Okay. Um, As far as velocity technique goes, I've never been really good at that because there's just some, it didn't matter how much I practised, I could never say pick the guitar like John McLaughlin could where he picked every note or like Pat Martino. No matter how much I practised, I could never, ever do that. And I've noticed that in certain in students, some people, there's a point where you can do it and there's a point where you can't do it. Right. You have, when, when you realise, and it'll be, probably be around about the age of, you know, mid-20s, it's never going to happen. What you have to do is let go of that. Mm. 
and then work on every other aspect of your playing so that you end up having really good technique to do. That is to play what you can play. You can play it all very, very accurately with a good time feel, with a great sound and a great touch. That's what technique becomes. I guess that's I guess that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know I know what you're saying about yeah. Uh, when I, yeah technique was probably the probably not the not the right word, but to be able to uh, have to have your facility at a point where whatever you think that you want to play, you're able to play it. I guess that's what I was. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. To, you, to, no. To you did ask wanting. it like that. Yeah. yeah. I, oh, okay. All right. Cool. Uh, it was a good question. Uh, I mean, nicely put as well. Um, I perhaps went off on that technique no, when no. I wanted to get that in because I just want yeah, to cool. clear that one up, you know, about what that means when people generally at a general level talk about technique um, because you could, I, I'm saying that somebody that plays quite a slow hand like a Bill Frizzell has got the mm. most incredible technique, but there may mm. be some people that go, oh, no, there's guitar players that got way more technique than him. But mm. but they're the, generally talking about perhaps velocity at that point, you know. Okay. Yeah. Yep. You know, mm. that's what yep. that means. Um, yeah. So, uh, but technique is an all encompassing uh, word. Um, but yes, I guess so. I mean, um, like Mark Punch, a great guitar player, said once that we all, there's always a point where you hear somebody do something. That, that you love and you go, I can't do that with my technique and you wish you could. Yeah, you wouldn't be human yeah. if you said no, you know, unless you're one yeah. of those guys that really is the fastest guitar player or the fastest, quickest l- moving limb drummer on the planet Earth. Um, but I suppose that, but th- I, I guess to them, there's still somewhere else that they want to go. I yeah. guess so. I it's guess, always going to be that, yeah. I, I guess so. I mean, yeah. uh, absolute. But, uh, yeah, I suppose there is, I've had enough, got to a point where I got enough technique. To me, it was always more about having enough musical understanding to deal with the music that was mm. Uh, mm. in front of me. And I have to tell you, um, I am known as a jazz guitar player and it okay. took me a lot of years before I was even game enough to say that I might think of myself as a jazz guitar player because to me, I never set out to be a jazz guitar player. I just loved jazz, but I was smart enough to know if I want to know how music goes together harmonically, I need to look in jazz because you won't get that through R&B and pop and and rock and and, mm-hmm. and straight blues. Mm-hmm. Yes, you'll get a lot of answers are going to be answered. Uh, a lot of your questions are rather going to be answered in those genres. But if you want to understand how it really goes together, Jazz is the most dense arena for that, you know, apart from classical. Jazz are music that you can take part in. And I I actually looked in jazz mainly to get, well, if someone plays um, E13 flat nine to me, how do I know what notes to play on it, you know, and, and, and different unusual chord progressions. I've always set out to try to get my technique to the point in my mind where somebody gives me the most unusual chord progression, I, after a little bit of time, I can make very good sense of it. I can mm-hmm. start to hear and see and figure out a way to actually get through the thing chordally and playing solo, uh, playing yep. a solo through. That's been my main quest, I have to say. Now, going back to Dave Sanders, Dave, Dave um, has a question. Who were the musicians that influenced you and what qualities do you think have rubbed off on you? Well, the earlier days was definitely um, um, Cliff Lambert, the guy that introduced me to the shadows and using my yep. ears to play. Okay. So he definitely influenced me. Yep. After that, there was Kerry Bedell. She was a mm-hmm. huge influence on me. Yep. Uh Mark Punch, the guitar player, was a big influence on me. We ended up playing together. I was uh, mucking about with some jazz at the time I met him as a young man, and he was more into Scotty Moore and and uh, and R and B of the time and blues. Uh, I listened to quite a bit of that stuff, but not never paid a lot of attention. 
but I liked his enthusiasm for it. He liked what I was up to because I was had a few extra chords and things under my belt. And we hung out together. And then we ended up playing in the uh, the very first uh, Renee Gay band called Mother Earth. We played yep. together with Harry Bruce, by the way. With Harry, yeah. 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 And yep. Russell yep. Dunlop was the drummer. Mm-hmm. And that's where I got the shits with jazz. I remember getting so frustrated trying to break the code of it. I took all my jazz records down to Ashwood's in Pitt Street of the time, which is a secondhand uh, vinyl um, shop, and I sold the whole collection. I just went, get it out of my life. I've had it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to play the blues. Because <laughs> yeah. Mark, so Mark was a really big influence on me. Okay. Yeah, he was absolutely huge. And then, of course, there was every every person that pretty much that I worked with that was older than me. I was working with Errol Buttle, a, a, an incredible sax, jazz saxophone player who was yep. way, way older than me. And uh, I learned so much from these guys, you know, just just playing with them, just listening to them and, and how they phrase things and did this, that and the other. Um, I learned... I was always a question guy, you know. I remember Cole Nolan, the uh, the mighty uh, uh, keyboard player, but really at, at the organ. Uh, you know, he did a – we're playing one, some groovy tune at the time down at the Rocks Push somewhere or somewhere like that. And, and when it came to the turnaround of the tune, just to get back to the top of the form, he did this unusual turnaround. And I, as soon as we came off, I just walked up to him and said, Cole, what was that? What was that you did? I need to. So I've always, everyone's influenced me. And when they've done something, they've done something that piqued my interest. I always ask them. And they always answered me, by the way. And here's here's an answer that I got from a lot of the older musicians, which I didn't believe at the time. And now that I am one of those older musicians, I know it to be absolutely true. I said, "What, what do you think is the most important thing? about all this that we're doing, playing jazz and just playing music and, and, and just being a musician. And so many of them said, oh, it's the time feel. And I went, oh, surely it's knowing songs and, and, and being able to change the key of them and doing this, that and the other, all these other things. And they said, yeah, of course, that's all important, but the time feel. And I, now I know that to be true. Yeah. It's the time feel that's the most important thing in all of it. Yeah, because it doesn't matter how beautifully placed you are with your harmonic knowledge, with this really beautiful sound, and you know all the tunes in the world. If you don't play them with a good time feel, or indeed play them out of time, what you're playing is musically is a pile of nothing. Yeah, you're better off not knowing very much, having a, a just an ordinary sound, and playing with a great time feel. Well, my next question was going to be what makes a good rhythm section, and I think. I think time field would probably answer that, yeah. It can, is, yeah. You if you can have a drummer that's you know got all the chops and, but if he if he hasn't got a good feel or can't, I'm, I won't say keep time because I mean that's um subjective because time is allowed to it's allowed to move and stretch, I know. but you've got to know when then when to take it, you know. Um, but to me, it's it is what you're saying, of course. Like I know what you meant by that. Keep time, of course, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but good time can be quite elastic, you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we know what it means not to keep time. By the way, it means you unravel. You know, it just falls. Unravel. Yeah, it's a good. One. Yeah, it falls to pieces. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that what makes it work is the the beautiful meeting of the minds that happens with. For all of us, not so many players in your whole life, how you all fit together. And that means is if if it's working for you, you've got a band that's working, then you lose your drummer, you get another drummer in and it doesn't work. Does mm. that mean that that drummer that came in is, is not up to it or wrong? No, it just means yeah. the combination doesn't quite work. If you change the bass player, the same thing could happen as well, by the way. It is that unusual thing where there's a meeting of the minds and about where you want the beat to sit and the way that you are willing to push and pull with each other that's the magical part it's the drug part of it it's the hardest one to uh, get i've played with so many people my whole life that i really love playing with them but the ones that i really love playing with uh, are 
a fairly smallish group compared to the number of people who I have played with. Yeah. Yet I love, but am I saying everybody else I didn't enjoy it? I'm not saying that at all. Yeah. I'm just saying it's quite an, it's a unique thing when it happens, you know. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Let's talk a little bit more about your recording studio now. Okay. Um. Oh, sorry. I just let, <clears throat> we'll go back to the teaching a little bit. I just wanted to ask. Um. I mean, you spent all that time, um, as you were the head of the guitar studies at the Southern Cross University. Yeah. Um. Now, did you design the syllabus? Yes. Okay. Cool. Did, was that right from the outset, from when you got there? Yep. But I, yeah, I, okay, cool. I had a head start because I'd, I'd done a lot of teaching in Sydney prior to that, and and it's like any – I've just tried to do the same thing with any aspect of music that I've taken on. I've tried to do the best I can if I'm going to – at it. If I'm going to be a teacher, I'm going to really teach. I'm going to get yep. good stuff together for people. If I'm going to run a recording studio, I'm going to do as much as I can to learn about how to, yep. how to do it all. And yeah. so it's the it, I've just kept the same kind of um, mindset up through the whole journey. So yeah. I already had a bunch of stuff that, thank God, I did actually when I started coming in on the tertiary end of things. And yes, I did. So I did fine tune the uh, the course over a number of years. Yeah. What's been the most difficult aspect of that? Of 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 um. But yeah, being the head of guitar studies at. At university, the most difficult aspect. Uh, there's two that have become the most difficult aspects of doing this type of thing. It's disinterested students. Mm. They make it very difficult for to for me to operate in the way I need to operate if they're not really uh, interested. Uh, I, I I don't even mind if they're not, somebody's not incredibly naturally talented. You can always. We're always, all of us are going to get better if we do practice the right things. It's, I've had a lot of cats that um, you, you wouldn't say that they were kind of gifted that way, but if, as long as they were into it, I love teaching them. But the minute anybody was dicking around with my time and not interested, I, I really didn't like it. So there's that. And I also didn't like the bureaucratical thing above me that changed a lot, who had no kind of... Uh, real respect for the people, the teachers in the trenches, mm. they would, um, you know, they'd throw you on a sword, you know, quickest look at you. They, you know, they to pr protect their own positions and things. They really, see, I, I just look at it, if you're running a business, the people that are, that are working, that you're, you're the boss, you're looking at a whole bunch of people, I like to think that I would keep them all really happy. Yeah. I like to know who they are, what their name yeah, is. Yeah. Keep them happy. Well, and let's all have a good time while we do it. Uh, yeah. That that's that actually doesn't happen very much in that that world. Yeah. Wow. In your faculty, you'll find that there's a great brotherhood. Like, because Dave Sanders was a teacher there, so was yeah. Greg Lyon. No, no, yeah. no problem at all. I'm talking about once you start going higher up the chain. Yeah, you know? I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. All right, so back to the recording studio. Yeah. So when did you start thinking about your own recording studio? Is this why you were still um, you still uh, teaching at the uni or had you sort of wound, wound out the uni and was think, you were thinking of something to do? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I, I wound out of the uni gradually. I didn't just, yep. Um, yep. just stop and yep. went down in time and down to sure. nothing and then finally. And in between that time I'd um, – formed a good friendship with a, a guy that built an instrument for me. And we started talking about, um, he had a good workshop. Uh, it was an old general store in the countryside here. And we thought, uh, let's re let's record some stuff, you know? Mm. And so it just took off from there. And then Russell Dunlop from Sydney, who was the original drummer in the mother earth band with Harry yeah. and Mark yeah. Punch and myself and Renee, uh, he, he moved up and he uh, he bought into the business too. So we had a, a three-way interest, financial interest in this, making a little studio come together. And we start to make some inroads. But I, I didn't do anything with the computer. I was more like the musical director, okay. uh, directing the traffic musically. Russell was the main linchpin guy with the uh, uh, actual mixing. And Les, the other bloke that owned the place, he was more the hands-on a technical guy doing the tracking, et cetera, and so on. So we had a nice three-way split. 
Yep. And then Russell managed to um, leave the planet in the most spectacular fashion. He went down to Sydney for his son's um, wedding mm. um, and was playing at the wedding and playing with Barry Leaf mm. and um, Bill Twyman, little trio thing, at his son's wedding and promptly um, fell unconscious on the bandstand in between the set and he, he uh, didn't make it. So <laughs> that rocked our boats. I can tell you that rocked the boats of a lot of people. He was the greatest cat, yep. groovy drummer. Oh, yeah. Um, we all love Russell. And it frightened us too because Russell, we all thought he was the guy that the cat couldn't scratch. He was made of blue steel. But yeah, it just right. lets you know that you're not sometimes, you know. That's it. You've got to be careful. Don't be too blokey about aches and pains, I reckon, is my advice. Yep. Um and so all of a sudden I was now doing, started to do some of the mixing over at the studio and uh, I was kind of, you know, uh, Les had good confidence in me. I didn't have a lot of myself. I did it something for a band and I, I went, I can't do this. And uh, calm, he calmed me down and I said, I had another go at the mix and it came out a bit better. And then it, it went from there and then Les and I, um, ended up uh, splitting the studio up. He he really wasn't um, that fussed about running it anymore. And I brought all the gear home that I'd bought with my share of it all and piled it up in this double garage here and went, well, what am I going to do? Uh, and then just got the idea, I'm going to, I think I'll really go, I'm going to try and do it. And that's that's what happened. So I just kept kept at it you know and it's i have to say i um it's mixing um it's like i study it i'm just all i'm doing about it is what i did i just because i knew where to look to learn how to play the guitar yeah i just i figure i know where to look to learn how to how to mix you know yeah you just got to figure it out where it's mostly where to look don't don't listen to people that don't know what they're talking about there's no yeah. point yeah and it, it, like, it, the big part of mixing too, it also goes back to what your old mate said about using your ears. Yeah, got to use your ears. It's the ears. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's not it's not the gear. I mean, you, you can just have reasonable gear and you can still make great stuff. It's not it's not gear. It, I mean, it, it real it just isn't. You know. Mm. What do you find the biggest challenge with, say, for example, Logic? Because you, you're recording into Logic. Um, one of the hardest things to do, I'll, I'll say it this way, then we can maybe mm. figure out if I, if I haven't answered you, I'm not sure if this is going to answer it. Um, cool. beyond a shadow of a doubt, the thing that's the, the biggest challenge is recording a band all at once. Okay. When you've got the multiple mic thing around the drums and you're taking care of everybody, um, mm. uh, four or five people all performing at once and you're taking care of the headphone mix, you're watching yep. the levels, you're, yep. you're keeping your ear your, and your eye on everything, yep. That that is one of the biggest challenges. The and management. If, yeah. yeah, the management. And of course, yeah. if something goes wrong, which it does a lot, can with a yeah. computer, Yeah, and the logic program might be giving you grief, that's when it, that's what becomes a, a really stressful problem when yeah. there's people sitting here. Yeah. Twiddling their thumbs while you're trying to sort it out. Yeah. 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 Um, now, let's talk about um, your approach to actually like tracking yourself and recording yourself these days. Coming from that, um, you know, 12 year career in, in sessions. Yep. No doubt a, a, a huge part of that, you would have gone in and you would have been playing whole takes. Because you know you're doing it to tape, and you're not, you don't have that option to punch in, and maybe, yeah. maybe you do a little bit, but you know what I'm saying. I do. You 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 learn that skill of, you know, playing from start to finish, and and then doing it over and over and over and again. That's just what you had to do, right? Yeah. These days, um, you know, we have Logic and Pro Tools and stuff, and it's digital, and we're able to just record one note or whatever. Um, yes. When you when you go to 
track yourself. Yep. Are you still going in with that that old school mindset of playing the whole thing and then maybe playing it again or are you very conscious of that you know you can do it quickly another way? So do you go down the route of just recording what you have yeah. to have to record? Okay, yeah. I got a, I got some thoughts about this. Cool. Number one is when you stop doing gigs, like I used to be a gig guy. That's what I did. Yep. I could never ever see any point in my life, as long as I was um, healthy and upright, where I wouldn't be out doing gigs. Well, I am. I am healthy and upright. But I'm not yeah. out doing gigs. I haven't been yeah. for a, a long time now. Mm-hmm. What happens is that you do lose a match condition bit of business about playing in the immediate way. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's bound to happen because we're all being kept in a kind of a state of some sort of musical fitness by the number of gigs that you do. Yep. That's what keeps you, you know. So there's that. The other thing is that when you go to do an overdub, just say, well, just say it's a solo. You do an overdub for a solo. When you when you do a solo at the gig, and it's going into the ether, if it's a good solo, well, like a world beater, one of your best, it's gone into the ether. People love it. If it's one of your worst, it's gone into the ether, and people forget about it. It's gone. Mm. Mm. There's no. Um, repercussions for it one way or the other about having it um, immortalised. This this business of doing it here, that means sometimes I might find myself playing a solo on something at uh, 11 o'clock, you know, before lunch. I'm sitting here by myself with no, there's no um, stimulus from other people Laughter and life and a bar over there and all, all the things that go to make a gig that make mm. you play the way you play when you get back on after you got the first set out of the way, now you're really warmed up. None of that exists when you do it from here. Mm-hmm. I've learned to not be too hard on myself about not being able to do it from the top to the bottom and get it dead right because I go, hang on a second, because when I do spend more time and do quite a few drop-ins, once it's done, it's done. That's all yep. that people are going to hear. Yeah. Uh, and when I hear it done and I go, gee, that I've worked on that one, I'm happy with that. Do you know that it, when I was in match condition, on any given night I could play a solo nowhere near as good as that or I could possibly even play a solo that was way better than that. Yeah. <laughs> I could go either side of it in the real way of playing. So you see what I'm saying there? Like, yeah, man. Yeah. That's, that's how I think of it. And as Pat Matheny said once when he did something that he didn't like in a solo and he wanted to redo the thing uh, and he did drop the bit in, he just he, he just he said it just changed his life. He just went and it worked out perfectly when he fixed it and he was happy. He went, i got to keep remembering it is a recording. It's a modern recording studio. If it right. is, use it. <laughs> Okay, good. That's how I look at it. Yep, that's answered the question. That, that That's me. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm just not going to drag myself over the coals that it took me two hours to play, uh, put together a, a well-developed solo. I'm just not going to uh, agonise over it. But mostly, I mean, a lot of the times it'll be sort of a, a long solo might be in, say, three sections where it's mainly getting um, – um, I just keep playing it over and over and recording things until I find something that's a good beginning to the solo. Yeah, that's what I need the most is a good beginning because my style of playing is I'm not a lick orientated player. If you go and get um, bunches of my recordings, you're not going to find licks that that um, just keep occur. You know, you hear them all the time. I don't. Yep. I don't play. I, I've, I've always tried to avoid that mindset of playing. Mm-hmm. I've trained myself and practiced so that I'm more open to uh, being reactive to the situation in the moment without a lot right. of preordained stuff. That's so not true, to say that I don't have licks, you know. Yeah, I you, do. Everyone you're a true, does. True but, improviser. 
Yep. Yeah, I, I want. Yeah, it's. Yep. That's that's what I've set out to be my whole okay. life was yep. more that than even a session player. To be honest with you, yep. it was to be a good improviser. That's been my yeah, driving right. um, kind of force. So, uh, I've forgotten what I was saying. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but anyway. Bloody blah, blah. Yeah. No, you've, yeah. Yeah, you've answered the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Um, I mean, you've, uh, yeah, you've, you've um, recorded a bunch of um, albums for yourself and yeah. you know, all, all about the drummers, um, onwards and sidewards. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, a whole bunch that yeah. I, I'm, you know, I, I haven't got all the names of, yeah. In, yeah. in front of me. Um, do you have anything new on the horizon? You're writing, recording yeah, oh, yeah there's always. The yeah, I've just finished um, an album for uh, uh, a gal. From, no, I mean for yourself. For, for myself. Yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, in fact, um, that uh, you've got to love the drummers was volume one, the one that you volume were, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, volume two is sitting there. I, I just I've been too busy. It's sitting there oh, ready, cool. and we're still, just my wife and I are just trying to figure out how do we release it now. I mean, no one's got a CD player anymore for a start. You know, right. all that sort of stuff. We're just figure out what to do it's sitting there yeah. and i've got yeah. other tracks yeah. um already done for other things so i'm, right. I'm kind of burbling it's the cauldron's got the you know the fire never goes yeah. out yeah. under the cauldron there's always some sort of goop bubbling up you know yeah yeah, yeah. that's great <laughs> um now before i wind it out is there yeah. anything that you wanted to talk about that we that we missed um Oh no, it's been uh, it's been easy talking with you about it all. That's oh cool. Yeah, That's the idea. And, you know, I've I've laid out the whole thing really in a way. You know, yeah. I, I I prefer talking about the philosophical thing of it. What what's your driving forces? What makes you uh, 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 want to play? And and I mean, I oh, here's one that I like to say. I've realised that I fit into a ca- category of musician where I've noticed. It's just come to me in a in a more clarified way just over the last couple of months. There are a lot of people, and, I, and when I say this, um, whatever category anyone fits into, don't think it's it's right and wrong. It's just something I've noticed. There are a lot of players that that are happy to play as long as their hands are moving across their instrument of choice, and they're out with their mates. Any given situation, they're happy to play. Yeah, it fills them full of joy. I'm not one of those people, unfortunately, in a way. Okay. Uh, I, I'm i one of those people that when I, this is one of the reasons why I've stopped playing a lot, is when I do stuff, I, I'm i just part of the, I'm a cog in the wheel of it all. It's the music that the band creates is yep. what floats my boat, not whether I play well and okay. I'm enjoying playing because my fingers are moving across the neck and I've got a good sound or whatever, that won't do it for me. It has yep. to be what's going, the language between us and what music we're actually playing. Is it worthwhile, By my, in my opinion, that is. Yep. Um, it, it's got to do more with that than anything for, for me to have the desire to play. Right. I've uh, realised that's, I mean, if I'm playing in something where it's not happening, I'd prefer to put the guitar down and and go and order another drink, you know, at the, sure. and what, yeah, yeah. from the and just watch from the bar. Yeah, you know, that'd be probably more fun for me, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I I need to have the the I. In other words, I know what did this. It was the Crossfire Band set a stage for me to a way to behave myself musically for all of my life. Yeah. Because that band rehearsed the crap out of what we did yeah. and we all practiced like demons and I've tried to do that all my life with everything that I've done. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a hell of a bar that's been set there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Try and chase that for the rest of your yeah, life. Yeah, that's right. But yeah. I, that's what I've yeah. tried to do. Yeah. I mean, I you know, I was teaching. I, I had yeah. to feed my family because the music business kind of fell, fell in a bit of a hole. It's in another kind of hole too now, as we know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I've always been. Oh, I've got to feed the family. I've got to do that. But I kept doing stuff while I was teaching as well, making yep. records, writing music, yep. coming to Sydney and putting bands through the basement, etc. And yep. so on. You know. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's great, Jim Kelly. This has been a 
Oh, hang on. I'll try that again. <laughs> trying to think of the right superlatives. <laughs> Oh, hang on! I've got some left over here. Yeah, <laughs> use them. <laughs> no, what I, what I'm trying to say is, um, it's been a really a, a real honour to talk to you and and um, yeah, listen to you talk and and um, hear your philosophies and um, shame we couldn't be face to face. Yeah, I'm man. Sure, I'm sure we'll get there. This is um the the best way if we can't be, but hopefully we that's will a, see each right. other one day. You know, that's and right. we can. That's uh, right. Um, really take it up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I uh, wish you all the best. I wish you onwards and sidewards, as, as you said in <laughs> one of your email sign-offs. Yeah, a, that's right. A while back. Yeah. yeah. I that's borrowed really that cool. from Michael Palin, by the way. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. he said it, uh, onwards and sideways, he said. I went, oh, yeah. gee, that's funny. You know, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Great. All right, Jim. Stevie, Jim, thanks Pat- so much, man. And um, thank you for being a, a, a gracious interviewer. And uh, a fabulous listener, and every question you ask just seemed to naturally flow on. You know, it uh, it was uh, a delight for the experience with you. Oh, thank you, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. All right, take it easy, Jim. Have a good Christmas. Okay. And, um, yeah, you yeah, too. Lo- loved all the family, mate. And, uh, and yeah, um, just keep those snakes up there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Peace, Stevie. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.